Good afternoon. My name is John Gastright, and I'm president of the Project 2049 Institute. Uh, welcome to this fourth edition of the Project 2049 Strategic Competition Webinar. We have a record number of uh, RSVPs to participate in today's near and present danger strategic competition in the Western Hemisphere event. So uh, with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go straight to our chairman, Randy Shriver, and uh, for the introductions. Chairman Shriver. Great. Well, thanks, John. Uh, we're delighted to play host to this very important discussion, uh, China's growing presence, activities, and influence in the Western Hemisphere. We are well aware of the strategic competition between the United States and China and its impact on the Indo-Pacific region. There's been less discussion about uh, other geographic areas of responsibility to include our own hemisphere, but those that are on the front lines see it, sense it, and, and deal with it every day. So we have uh, an outstanding program for you, led off with our keynote speaker, Admiral Craig Fowler. Uh, Admiral Fowler asked for a short introduction, don't provide too much, but it's difficult for me uh, given that I served with him recently and have so much respect for him, but I will honor that request and just suffice to say uh, he's a very accomplished Naval Academy grad, Naval Postgraduate School grad. Uh, as a surface warfare officer, he served as commanding officer at several levels of a guided missile destroyer, guided missile cruiser, and some carrier strike group. Uh, but I got to know him when he served as the senior military assistant to then Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, and I was serving as Assistant Secretary of Defense. In that regard, uh, Admiral Fowler was really the right-hand man to Secretary Mattis as we were developing the key strategic documents, including our national defense strategy. So now, given his perch as Commander U.S. Southern Command, he really can combine that strategic level vision that uh, was developed in the Office of the Secretary of Defense at the right-hand side of the Secretary of Defense and, and what he's observing day-to-day -day as the operational commander in that region. So understanding strategic competition with China and now uh, really at the pointy end of the spear and dealing with it. And we think this is an underappreciated topic, uh, particularly here in Washington. And so we look forward to really uh, regarding this as, a, as an educational opportunity and, and hopefully giving us some ideas of, of where we can promote this discussion and, and future policy choices down the line. So without further ado, very honored to have uh, Admiral Craig Fowler join us. Admiral? Well, Chairman Shriver, Randy, uh, Mr. Shriver, all the above, great to see you again and great to see such a talented team. I, I really appreciated our time together uh, when you were the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-PACOM uh, and your intellect and focus uh, and calm, cool, collective nature despite 23-hour trips at times. So also great to, to see uh, Dr. Chavez, uh, Rebecca, good to team up again in another venue. And Ms. Mukai, nice to meet your acquaintance virtually, and I look forward to the discussion day. Important discussion. We talked about Secretary Mattis and the National Defense Strategy. The key concept that was baked into that strategy by then Secretary Mattis was this idea of expanding the competitive space, of being the best that we can be across all dimensions uh, and being the best on the field, to use the sports analogy. Part and parcel to that was recognition that the problem we faced involved recognizing that we were in competition, that to be able to talk open and honestly about what that meant and what it is. And today we find ourselves talking a lot and focused a lot on the Indo-Pacific region, rightly so. The tensions in the Taiwan Straits, the South China Sea, building of islands all demand our attention. The Pacific Deterrence Initiative and other initiatives so important. Indo-PACOM Commander Admiral Davidson in his last testimony before he retired stated that China is the, two, the number one strategic threat we face in the 21st century, and I could not agree more with his statement. But that competition, borderline conflict in some domains, is not just playing uh, itself out in Indo-PACOM. It's right here, right now, in this region, our neighborhood of the Western Hemisphere, and it's playing out around the globe. My dad's 83 years old. Well read, very smart, watches too much TV, lives in central PA, asks me all the time, hey, what are you doing this week? Why should I care? Or why should any Americans or why any of our international audience care about Latin America and the Caribbean in the context of global competition in China? For us, it's about values. It's about democracies and the importance of those institutions going forward. I look at this region, our neighborhood here, of a region of, of real promise, the proximity, 
Location matters, distance to the United States, key. The people, those values associated with the people and the cultural connections. The economic dependencies and the important economic powerhouse that this region really is and then resources to have and fresh water at the top of that resource list. Very underappreciated dimension of the resources that are uh, truly a blessing in this region. But it's those values that connect us and make it a true neighborhood. In addition to all the physical domains like sea, air, space, and cyber that we warfighters always talk about, the values are what's key. And it's those values and they're tied to democratic institutions that's really under assault. The pandemic brought that forward. That's a vicious circle of threats, this assault. Um, really that vicious circle creating almost the perfect storm. Climate change plays right into it. We saw this last year where on top of an already fragile hemisphere, we added the pandemic and then we had back-to-back -back major hurricanes that devastated Central America. I mean, really set the conditions back in Central America to analogous to those of the Great Depression here in the United States. There are threats that feed on these conditions. One, transnational criminal organizations, a threat that should be recognized in our national security documents that murderous organizations and narco trafficking is only a small piece of their overall power base. They thrive on and are fueled by corruption. Right alongside them are external state actors, authoritative regimes. And so how do we think about these authoritative regimes and think more critically about those authoritative regimes and our values, which are so key to the international world order and this neighborhood? We owe it to ourselves to consider how important the investment in partnerships is in terms of those shared values. That's what's key going forward. Now, I often hear a myth, and this myth is perpetuated globally, that PRC's interests beyond the Indo-PACOM are only economic or primarily only economic in nature. Um, I think it's global dominance to ensure their economic uh, security and the security of the People's Republic of China, the Communist Party that's key. This myth often obscures the inconvenient truth that Chinese Communist Party, with its insidious and corrupt influence, seeks global dominance, wants to impose its own version of existing rules-based international order. They want to create a system in which authoritative regimes are viewed as legitimate forms of governance and the rule of law, human rights, and free speech are subordinate to the interests of states. I see that playing out when I talk to partners. It's okay. We'll be able to deal with it. We're strong democracies. We know how to deal with authoritative regimes. But when you look across the hemisphere and the globe, but in this hemisphere, I see 40 port projects of various shapes and sizes in work. Now, why is the PRC pursuing deep water ports in Jamaica, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, and other places? Along with these ports and other projects often comes exposure to that corruption that underlines this instability in the region, an erosion of sovereignty, and an undermining of the security associated with critical infrastructure. Now, it's not just these ports and their access. It's space. It's cyber. It's safe and smart city projects, some 31 of them and growing in the region. It's 5G technology. They all give PRC a backdoor into sensitive information, infrastructure, and power, a way for them to take their seemingly soft aims and turn them into hard power targets of influence. I think that's key. And it gives them a front seat for strong arm influence and coercion. A few stories to illustrate. Recently traveled to Uruguay and Argentina. Vibrant democracies, uh, both with, have gone through elections in the last year, met with the Minister of Defense, senior defense leaders, and, and even in Argentina, where they expressed desire to stay with the United States. We visited the port of Ushuaia, the furthest port in the hemisphere south before jumping off to Antarctica. And it's a strategic port for access to the Strait of Magellan resources, and it's a port where China has aims, legitimate commercial aims, that could be used to carry out scientific research or be used to scale up to other interests. We talked about this. We also focused on the Chinese-run space station in Nuquan. On Sunday, I'll travel to Panama. We'll talk about important issues. I'll meet with all our Central American security partners there. And the Panama Canal is obviously another very important global strategic waterway. PRC is heavily invested in there roads, bridges, railways, IT infrastructure, and influence. The PRC is taking these soft aims and hard power influence and trying to create clients, not friends. 
and I see that across the hemisphere. They're trying to leverage their soft aims for greater economic and political gain. For example, China has recently used the vaccines uh, as a way to gain leverage in 5G and leverage in the Taiwan uh, recognition. I've seen this firsthand. I flew into Argentina the day I arrived. A half a million Chinese vaccines happened to show up. We were donated in a hospital tent. China was donated in a half a million vaccines. A week later, Dominican Republic, we're donated in a hospital tent. China's donated in a half a million vaccines. Coincidence, same day as my delivery? I don't think so. When I go to countries, and we've never stopped traveling during the pandemic, we found the travel to be more essential than ever to connect and build partnerships. I don't ask partners to choose between the US and China. We're here to talk about our relationship, but we do talk about values. And we do ask questions about those values, free speech, rule of law, respect for human rights, gender equality. And we do have programs. It's I've come for all those values baked into our professionalism. And I do say, where do, where do you partner want to ultimately be with respect to those values and how do you think China stacks up on that scale versus the United States? So how do we win this strategic competition going forward? And what does winning look like here in the Western Hemisphere from a Southcom perspective? One, we've got to remain the trusted partner hands down. So that means staying on the field. We've got to be on the field to compete. And that means being relevant and operating with some relevant speed and making sure that our own programs don't and policies get in the way of that speed. That means being consistent. There is a narrative that our partners in this hemisphere particularly feel abandoned, or perhaps that we're not engaged enough. I reject that based on my own travel schedule from a Southcom perspective, so I don't agree with that assessment, but I do think we can do a better job responding at the speed of relevance. And unfortunately, sometimes our own nine month budget cycle gets in the way of that consistency and speed of response. I think about what we did as a nation after World War II, the, the long-term nature of that global commitment that built our international systems today. I look at what we did in Colombia with Plan Colombia. That was a long-range decade uh, investment that required a good and equal investment from our partners, but didn't change every budget year or every election cycle. And I look at our recent statements from the G7, the NATO summit, and our own emerging um, Secretary of Defense guidance, and I'm very encouraged by that long-term commitment and focus that's coming into our documents. We have an opportunity now more than ever in this pandemic to seize the moment and renew our reputation and renew these trusted partnerships. President Biden said it best, you know, the U.S. is the largest pledge by far of vaccines globally, and we're beginning to deliver, but he said it best this week, or recently, the U.S. will be the world's arsenal of vaccines in our shared fight against the virus. I think we're the arsenal of, of values as well as we look to build strong partnerships globally. Here at Southcom during the pandemic to, to help counter that perfect storm, uh, we've got about 500 humanitarian assistance projects, uh, and it's been very good to stay on the field for where our partners' points of need are. We've got to be responsive. We've got to be consistent. We've got to have modest investments. It doesn't take a lot, but we've got to be on the field to compete. And our regional international partners, who I know are, are involved in today's important dialogue, can be key to this effort. During our regional response to those massive hurricanes, Ida and Iota, last November, regional partners, Japan, Taiwan, and others stepped up. Canada, Mexico, UK, France, Netherlands are playing every day for stability here in the region. Just an hour ago, we hosted here at headquarters the Chief of Navy from the Netherlands, who have important, legitimate interests for stability and security here in the neighborhood. There's more we can do together to develop frameworks and responses, mill to mill, security to security, defense to defense, and government to government to help ensure those democratic values and strong institutions survive and thrive as we go forward 
working together, we can enhance democracies and prevent the PRC from imposing its world order and creating dependencies. And this means everything from simple things we're doing with US Army Corps of Engineers to help partners build good contracts and good tenders, helping partners evaluate PRC-based projects to ensure they're delivering on international standards of safety and quality, and harvesting, harnessing the interagency and private sector to bring much needed investment. It means shoring up partners' cyber defenses a defense against surveillance and cyber attacks from all actors, including this PRC. And it means the right level of investment at the right speed. It might not even be more in humanitarian assistance, security cooperation, cybersecurity, intelligence, information sharing, transparent governments, training and education. All of this goes a long way to build resiliency, build partnerships, and present, prevent China's malign influence in this region. Trusted partnerships built to last based on shared democratic values. That's the key to winning the competition. And importantly, from my perspective, Southcom commander, helping ensure the promise of our neighborhood. So thanks uh, team, Randy, and I look forward to further discussion here. Admiral Fowler, thank you very much for those important comments and really appreciate the fact that you bring that uh, personal experience, the observations that uh, you've had on the job and, and that you also provided us some uh, very uh, thoughtful ways forward and things we should be considering. Um, Admiral Fowler has graciously agreed to, to stay on for some questions, but, but prior to that, we're going to have comments and reactions. Uh, first, uh, we have Dr. Rebecca Bill Chavez. She is a non-resident senior fellow at the Inter-American Dialogue and a senior advisor at the Center for Naval Analysis. Uh, she previously served as Deputy, Se Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Western Hemisphere Affairs, so very much uh, active in this portfolio. And prior to that, served as a uh, professor at the Naval Academy, so we have a bit of a naval theme going here, which uh, is, is always a good thing, in my opinion. And we'll have uh, assistance in the discussion from uh, our non-resident fellow at Project 2049, uh, Yuko Mokai, who's joining us from Japan. So appreciate uh, the, the very early hour there, I think 2.30 or 3 in the morning. Uh, but uh, this topic is important for all of us, including our Japanese friends. So very much look forward to Yuko's comments and, and helping guide the discussion when uh, we get to questions and answers. So uh, Dr. Chavez, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Randy. And also thank you to John for inviting me here this afternoon. And Admiral Fowler, Fowler, really is great to see you again. I'm especially great, grateful to Project 2049 for drawing attention to the significant growth of Chinese influence in the Western Hemisphere. The Americas are far too often overlooked um, when it comes to broader discussions of US-China global competition and also of US-China strategy. So the reality is that our neighbors increasingly look to China rather than to the United States. I want to start by just providing a bit of background on the strength of the economic ties between China and Latin America and the Caribbean. Chinese demand for Latin American raw materials was critical in helping the region's economies weather the 2008-2009 Great Recession. China surpassed, surpassed the United States become, to become the top trading partner of some of the region's biggest economies. This includes Brazil, Chile, Uruguay, um, Peru. And China has free trade agreements with Chile, Costa Rica, and Peru. 19 Latin American and Caribbean countries have joined the Belt and Road Initiative, and we've seen a surge of PRC-backed infrastructure projects from roads to ports, which Admiral Fowler mentioned. And then there are the Chinese loans, um, which the PRC touts as having no strings attached. Part of the appeal is that they don't have the same governance, um, environmental conditions associated with loans from the United States or from international financial institutions. So what we're seeing is cash-strapped countries turning to China as the lender of last resort. But these deals, they have not been without a cost. And I think the case of Argentina is a really good example. In the case of Argentina, very um, vulnerable financially. Um, it was during the presidency of Christina Kirchner 
um, and she had really no room to negotiate when it came to the PLA run space station and Neo Ken. As a result of this, Argentina has very little oversight over what happens at this. It's a huge 500 acre compound. And it's worth noting that Christina Kirchner's back. Um, she's vice president this time, but she's still um, calling the shots. And Argentina has declared its intention to further deepen its relationship with China. It's also worth pointing out that the Chinese assistance does not come with the same conditions, but there are expectations, including switching diplomatic um, recognition from Taiwan to China. Panama really honestly blindsided the United States with its diplomatic switch in 2017. Um, they didn't really consult with the United States, and I think that's a real indication that we've been losing ground. Dominican Republic and El Salvador followed suit in 2018. So what should the U.S. response be to the strategic competition in the region? I really appreciated the Admiral's remarks about his approach when he talks to partners. Um, he doesn't enter the discussion and say, hey, you need to choose between the U.S. and China. And I think all agencies, all U.S. agencies should take this approach, not just the Department of Defense. Forcing countries into a corner it doesn't work, and it's actually backfired. I was in Santiago shortly after Secretary Pompeo's 2019 trip to Chile, and it was during this trip that he um, told the Chileans, you know, you, you're going to have to make this choice between the U.S. and China, but he didn't offer any sort of alternative. The reaction was negative, not just in political and government circles, but also in the population at large. In Chile, 77% view China favorably versus 61% when it comes to the United States. And I would guess that gap has grown um, since Chile has been the re recipient of so many um, Sinovac vaccines. So I agree with um, Admiral Thaler. The smart thing for the US to do, it's really quite simple and it shouldn't be that difficult. We need to be the type of par partner our neighbor neighbors will want to choose the partner that they turn to first. This is gonna mean following through on commitments and building trust. Um, we're gonna to have to have a strategy of engagement that transcends administrations. When um, the Trump administration cut funding to Central America in 2019, China stepped right in to fill the void. So we're gonna to have to have sustained policies of investment and development, promotion of trade, and the U.S. has an opportunity to play a key role in post-COVID economic recovery. Um, this is going to be incredibly important in Latin America and the Caribbean. The economic outlook in the Americas is among the worst in the world. The contraction, the, GD, the GDP contraction in 2020 is estimated at 8%. So, Something else is for the U.S. to demonstrate that it's a reliable and committed partner, it has to show that it listens. It's going to require asking questions about and understanding the needs of our partners. We have to show that we care more, we care about more than just migration and drugs. We need to ask them, you know, what are your greatest security challenges? How can we work together to advance our shared interests? And we can do this. We've got some great examples from the Southcom AOR. Admiral Fowler and his team, they listen and they're responding, not just in areas like cybersecurity or the humanitarian assistance and disaster relief um, that he mentioned, also um, in defense institution building, but also in illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing which has been a huge concern um, for countries along the Pacific coastline from Mexico to Chile and also in Argentina. Partners have told us time and time again that the Chinese fishing fleets, they're growing in size and they're also becoming increasingly aggressive. Illegal fishing violates sovereignty, um, it neg negatively impacts economic livelihoods, and it also impacts food supplies. Southcom is doing a remarkable, um, remarkable work, work in this area. The U.S. Coast Guard is a key player um, in U.S. interagency efforts with international partners to stem illegal fishing. And the initiatives include improving reporting and monitoring of the illegal fishing and also developing sound inspection practices at ports across the region. 
I just want to conclude with a few words about um, the COVID vaccine. The World Health Organization designated Latin America and the Caribbean as the epicenter of the pandemic. This region, it holds, it's home to 8% of the world's population, but it has accounted for 29% of COVID deaths worldwide. And it's in this context that Chinese medical diplomacy and during the pandemic, it's really been a natural outgrowth of the strong economic ties that I described earlier. And it's been a win for a region that has invested far too little for far too long in its health infrastructure. The U.S. is trailing in global vaccine distribution. You know, this is similar to when we were trailing in the provision of masks and ventilators. In fact, before we were started talking about vaccine diplomacy in the Americas, we were talking about mask diplomacy. This has really helped China in the public opinion battle with the United States, kind of feeding into this narrative that the U.S. is hoarding vaccines. I've been watching the Copa America, um, which is South America's you know, really biggest soccer tournament um, that started on Saturday in Brazil. And I was really struck. The signs that kind of go along the perimeter of the field, huge signs, ads that say Sinovac in huge letters. And it was just to me, it served as a reminder of the importance and the opportunity that we have now especially with the announcement of a half a billion vaccines to be distributed outside of the United States. We need to prioritize our hemisphere. Today, um, 1.3 million vaccines went to Mexico. That should just be the start. We really need to do more. So I'm gonna stop here. I wanna turn it over to Yuko because I'm really excited to hear the Japanese perspective given the positive impact of Japanese engagement in the region. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Randy and Joan and uh, Project 2049 Institute for inviting me today. Before I start my remarks, I just want to uh, make sure that today's my remark or my purely my personal opinions, not that of Yomiuri Shimbun, which I'm affiliated also. Uh, today I will offer a Japanese perspective in this region. Latin America and the Caribbean is a special region for Japan. First, this region holds the largest number of the people with Japanese descent all over the world outside Japan. They were called Nikkei, Nikkei-jin, approximately 2.2 million people region-wide. Second, this region carries no negative Japanese legacies from World War II, unlike some other areas in the world. These two factors tend to offer Japanese diplomacy smoother water to sell. Therefore, the expectations from the Japanese side are generally pretty high in terms of Tokyo's ability to enhance relations with countries in the region. Former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe made two exclusive tours to this region 2014 and 2018. Uh, through these tours, Abe uh, announced two initiatives called One uh, Three Funtos, which means Together, and uh, initiative to enhance connectivity policy. Through these initiatives, the Japanese government is trying to deepen not only the economic ties, but also the political engagement with this region. While not explicitly connected, Japan considers the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy as also applying to the Western Hemisphere. LAC countries are partners who share the fundamental values such as freedom, democracy, human rights, and rule of law. Japan accelerates its effort to have a closer high-level political dialogues with government in this region. In November 2020, this year, Foreign Minister Toshimitsu Motegi toured five countries and discussed regional security issues notably including the East and South China Seas, with his counterparts. An unstated and uh, underlining purpose of these dialogues uh, to help LAC countries recognize Chinese malign behavior in other parts of the world. Countries in the region need to be more aware about how the way how China seems to open the door under the banner of win-win economic and trade ties, but then advances its security interests. Through these dialogues, Japan appears to trying to raise awareness about the implications of growing Chinese influence and how our regions are interconnected. 
One example is how China is taking advantage of global COVID-19 pandemic to further its vaccine diplomacy all over the world. Another clear case is point is how China's Belt and Road initiatives has penetrated LAC. And if Chinese influence in this region expands further, its influence in other parts of the world expand as well, including the Indo-Pacific region. And now to begin Q&A, I'd like to pose a few questions to the speakers on this important topic. As China rises, Chinese political, economic, and military influence in Latin America and the Caribbean are growing as well. What are your assessment on the intent behind PLA activities in the region? And should other countries in the world, especially in the Indo-Pacific region, that geographically closer to China, be concerned by these activities and why? Panama broke diplomatic ties with Taiwan and established diplomatic relations with PRC in 2017. What lessons can we draw from the apparent Chinese ambition to control the Panama Canal for the expansion of the influence in the region? Adomiel, would you like to respond first? Sure, I'll break those. Thanks. And uh, great remarks, uh, both uh, Rebecca and uh, uh, from you, um, Ms. Mukai, I appreciate it. Um, I took lots of notes. I really um, I'm going to break that up into two things, and I'll paint a little more uh, fulsome picture of what I see China doing in the military dimension, and then extrapolate an assessment of what that means. Uh, it does go back to dominance and, and dominating the, the global world order in a way that ensures the, the viability and the survivability and the, and the growth of the PRC. Uh, but what we see is that China's recognized that many of the partner security institutions in this hemisphere are cash strapped. So they've gone to a program of gifts. Uh, sometimes the gifts don't match the needs, but I increasingly seen, seen an adjustment in that uh, as we go forward. And uh, there is, a, there is a, some narrative out there that suggests that the gifts are not lethal in nature, and that, that's simply not true. The gifts are, they span the spectrum. Um, and so we're seeing growing military gifts from trucks to fire trucks and hospitals, tents, and um, things, you know, and you would argue, hey, what's, what's wrong with that? Again, I think it goes back to dependencies. And it goes back with some of the way that the gifts are instilled and who's um, and how corruption is used in that process. Then it's in the PME realm. So professional military education, sorry for the acronym. I slipped. I try to be acronym free. It's hard. Um, so it's professional military education. So they've, they've clearly replicated the playbook from our top professional military education schools. Think Carlisle Army War College, Carlisle, Pennsylvania recently spoke at the War College in Pennsylvania, and I spoke to a, a student uh, from a Latin American country who had just come, who is now an instructor at our Army War College, who had just had that um, instruction in Beijing. And so again, the narrative out there that their PME quality doesn't match ours, that's going to change. China's going to figure out what, what sells and what works, uh, and certainly the volume of the quotas that they offer is growing. And again, no strings attached. And I think I've heard you all use that. They don't do uh, vetting for human rights. We call that Leahy vetting in the United States. And they, and they certainly don't uh, place any boundaries on the money that's associated with paying the stipends for those courses. But China's taken it up to another level. In one partner nation, they're offering 10 to 20 cyber scholarships per year to uh, newly commissioned second lieutenant, so entry-level military personnel, full immersion in, in uh, Mandarin, full immersion in a university in, uh, in uh, China, not a military installation where they're kept in a bubble. So by my calculations, in five to 10 years' time, 20% of that partner nation's military force will have be Mandarin speaker in addition to their other language languages, and have a cyber degree. Port access. So narrative is China has legitimate commercial interests, but these, these are insidious and they operate right below the level that could easily be scaled up for access to, 
to uh, military vessels, logistic ships, and so on. And the absence of those does not mean going forward that they will, that we won't see them. And in fact, there's a reason why China is building a blue water navy. If you look at where they're building ports um, or considering ports or trying to get port deals, and you look at Dominican Republic, Jamaica, Bahamas, Mexico, El Salvador, Panama, and we'll get to the Panama Canal, and you go on down and you think about ports, we think about ports more broadly, think about IT ports as well, and those 31 smart city and, and safe, uh, safe city ventures, uh, you, you can kind of see the, the envelope of the region, really a reverse engineering of the system that we've built in the Pacific uh, to help ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific that you talked about. So th that gets to Panama Canal. So you mentioned the great Japanese cultural uh, connection to the region. I see that and we've seen that play out in humanitarian projects elsewhere. Uh, I would note South Koreans have a great connection to uh, Colombia, for example, where they've built uh, hospitals and rehabilitation centers. China also has an indigenous population, particularly in Panama, because of the history, frankly, the brutal history of building the canal. But they've leveraged that population and they leveraged the corruption associated with the population in previous Panamanian regimes. Previous Panama regime uh, signed 44 different agreements with with uh, China. One official who's no longer politically elected remarked to me, we don't even know what's in some of those agreements. And that has become a fulcrum for influence and access on both ends of the canal and in between. And the canal is key waterway uh, for the United States, where a great portion of our trade coast to coast coalesces and flows through that canal. So I, I just sort of set the conditions. Where does that all go? Uh, that goes to ensure China's economy continues to grow and expand to be number one, and it sets the conditions for the gradual conversion of rules-based international order uh, that uh, I think each one of us speakers here today mentioned. I wanted, first of all, I wanted to kind of echo the Admiral's point about professional military education. This is something that the U.S. does extremely well. And I would argue that we need to put more resources into PME and invite more of our partners in the region to, to participate. This is what creates strong interpersonal ties. It cre creates these lasting relationships. So I think we should have more resources for that. And as far, I want to just, one other point I want to build on is this point about, you know, there are certain um, Chinese activities that I think really require special vigilance. The Admiral uh, mentioned ports. I would also say, you know, things like fiber optic cables, um, communication infrastructure, and then any, anything that could be dual use. And again, I want to highlight here the space station in Argentina we should be concerned about. And um, the Admiral mentioned his recent trip to Ush Ushuaia. You know, we've got Kirchner's known for making deals with the Chinese that give them really absolute control. So I think we should wa you know, watch carefully um, what happens, happens there. Um, it is a gateway to the Antarctic. And I just want to end with a little piece of good news. <laughs> and that's on Panama. As Admiral Fowler mentioned, the, pre the, the Varela administration signed all kinds of deals with the Chinese. And also, as he said, they lacked transparency, um, which was really problematic. The um, Cortizo government that stepped in in 2019 has a very different approach. Um, he's canceled or really kind of scaled down most of the Chinese projects in Panama. Panama still has a free trade agreement with Taiwan. Um, the talks with China broke down, so it does not have an FTA with China. But this is the moment then for the U.S. to really step up and engage with Panama. We can't take this relationship for granted. Um, we happen to have a government in Panama right now that is scrutinizing Chinese activity very, very closely. But, you know, something that the U.S. should do as quickly as possible is get an ambassador into Panama. We haven't had one since John Feely left. We haven't had a confirmed ambassador. Um, the Chinese ambassador in Panama speaks fluent Spanish, which is the case with a lot of um, Chinese, majority of Chinese ambassadors in the region. 
Panama initially resisted China's offers of va vaccine, but in April, they, um, they authorized the use of Sinovac. So the US, we should be sending vaccines to Panama today. My next question is nine countries among the 15 countries that Taiwan still have formal diplomatic ties with all over the world are in this region. Why and how should US and Japan to keep these countries as Taiwan's diplomatic partner despite of direct or indirect pressure by PRC? And also um, when the US-China competition gets um, or intense in this area. Is there any concerns to spread these countries into two groups for US or for China, especially when we consider the countries in Latin America often switches their administration to the left wing, to the conservative. So considering these domestic issues, what, how, how US or other countries should behave or should should engage with these countries? The, the approach we take in mill-to-mill -mill security to security, you know, since a few of our partners, Panama, particularly Costa Rica, they don't have militaries, they have security forces, is to take the long view on the institutions. And uh, it actually is a, is a provides us a framework to think about things that matter to strong institutions. And, and, and we go, I go back to values and relate that to the oaths that are common really to all democratic uh, security forces. We all swear an oath to values rather than to a political party or person. So when you take the long view and you're thinking about the long-term investments in those institutions, um, it gets us out of the, the swings in politics and, and gets us to focus consistently on uh, things that I would relate back to a term we call professionalism. So what is professionalism? It's, it's what makes you as a force trusted and legitimate by your population. So I'll go back to what Dr. Chavez said, training. Uh, and then I, I whipped through a quick list of those things when I spoke. It's uh, you know, inclusion programs, women's peace and security. We, we, we've wrapped our arms around that in a big way because we know it's important and it makes us better. It's our non-commissioned officers. It's our professionalism and our leadership training every step of the way for civilians and military. And so, you know, it, what I'm really kind of giving a bank shot to the Taiwan question is, you know, I think we share all those with Taiwan. We share all those with Japan. We share those with the like-minded democracies, irrespective of the changes in politics. And so that's the, the inoculation from uh, China uh, and their corrosive influence. And that's the long-term inoculation to change um, the trajectory that we see in this competition and continue to enhance and build rules-based international order. And it's built on these strong building blocks of institutions. Thank you, Admiral. Dr. Chavez, please. Sure. Um, so I agree with everything that Admiral said. Um, I um, want to kind of underscore the point that when we do engage with our, our partner nations that we have these long relationships with, really highlighting our shared values, the about you know democracy, um, human rights, and highlight you know some of the similarities we share when it comes to, to culture. We share so much with the countries of the region, and I think we should you know in all strategic mes messaging, highlight that. I think as far, I mean, Japan, I really think that Japan has been a force for good in, in Latin America. And I, th I think that increased Japanese engagement with the nine countries that you, that you listed could be very helpful. Japan can work with the United States to provide an alternative to China. And it's also worth noting that Japanese engagement in the region isn't new. They have, um, as you know, the Juntos framework that started up in 2014, you know, that's something that can be built upon. And another way that Japan can differentiate itself and the U.S. can differentiate itself from China is basically the quality of the infrastructure that's built. A lot of the Chinese projects have been, you know, they're, they're quite infamous because of their shoddy quality. And 
I think we've seen, right, there have been, been some Chinese overtures to Honduras, to Guatemala, and to Paraguay especially, um, using kind of the COVID vaccine as a carrot. But I think that this, this is why I think it's so urgent that we engage now. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral and Dr. Chavez and Randy. Now I'll turn to Colby. We have a few questions submitted from the external audience um, that put them on our YouTube feed before we uh, decided to go the recording route. Just one I thought was particularly keen, being conscious of Admiral uh, Fowler's time here, from a uh, Christopher Woody, journalist with Business Insider. He says, how great is your concern about China being able to limit U.S. military freedom of movement in the Southern Command area of operations, either through direct action or by acting through a partner country in the region? And then he followed it up with, you know, is there a part of your area of operations, such as the Caribbean, where you see China as having a greater interest? We talked about the investments that China is making, and I went through the list to cyberspace, IT, 5G. And it's those areas that I think are very critical for China's global access and influence and the U.S. and our like-minded partners uh, and allies uh, to ensure the free and open world, not just a free and open Indo-Pacific. And so if you, if you look for what, what it requires to operate a global space, what it requires to have information flow and information dominance and shape the information, I'm very concerned when I see the investments that are being made and the tie between civ and mill in China, which is by law um, a non-existent firebreak, ensures that that information is part and parcel of all state agencies, intelligence services, and ultimately is available for uh, war planners and decision makers in a way that's not available and rightly so in free and open uh, democracies. Um, with that, I believe I'll turn it back to our chairman. Great. Well, thanks again to our uh, very distinguished speakers, Admiral Fowler uh, and uh, Dr. Chavez and Yuko for joining us at such an early hour. This is for many in Washington, uh, Greenfield. There's a lot of work to be done here. I know for those that are on the front lines, this is what you're doing day to day along with your other responsibilities. But I'm encouraged by this discussion we've hosted today because it's, I think, generated a lot of ideas for us, what we can do here in Washington. We're going to use this uh, discussion today uh, to engage the Washington policy community and, and figure out uh, how we can be a constructive participant in trying to up our game. I think that was definitely one of the themes uh, we heard today is we need to improve and up our game because the competition is quite stiff. So thank you for our speakers. Thank you for those that uh, have joined us and we'll view the uh, video later. And uh, with that, I will close the proceedings. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, great to see everybody. Thank you.